Today's guest is an Emmy-nominated 20-time platinum songwriter and producer, best known for his work on High School Musical, The Musical, The Series, The J-Team with JoJo Siwa, BTS, and more. Please welcome to the Zoom, Matthew Tischler. Hey! Hello! <laughs> That's such a nice introduction, thank you. It's true, it's right off your website, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh that's so funny to hear it all just laid out like that you know it's an incredible intro oh my god emmy nominated we're gonna get into all of that all right all right yeah. um first of all thank you so much for being here and doing this i am honored to have you of course thank you so much for thinking of me and uh feeling that i'm worthy to join the ranks of your uh past <laughs> interviewees <laughs> my god are you worthy you're incredible um, well, we always start behind the resume by talking about how we met. And we, I guess, def technically officially met at JoJo's birthday party. We can thank JoJo Siwa. Yes, we can, we thank, can JoJo thank JoJo Siwa, Siwa for a lot. <laughs> um, yes, we but, can. Yes, we can. <laughs> I was kind of reaching out to you, though, a little bit before, which is how we both connected. <laughs> That's right. I saw, obviously, that you produced the music for the movie, and I'm obsessed with all the music. And then once I saw... Like I literally the first time I'm not joking. The first time I went to your website and I saw everything that you've done, tears. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not joking. Like, I'm not joking. I was like, like for me to see those people and those projects that you've worked on and to know that like I was a part of a movie of something that you've worked on, like it was just a very I don't know. It was, I started crying. Like it was incredible. That's cool. Oh, that's so nice to hear. I will say though, it's so funny because I feel like there's a certain age of people that I'm now just starting to get to know as adults and work with who were younger when I was working on a lot of these projects. So there's like a lot of extra relevance when they see some of these Disney Channel projects and Nickelodeon projects. Yeah. Um, they were actually part of their childhood growing up. So it's yeah. wild that now some of these people are old enough to be my peers and I'm running into them at events <laughs> and working with them on movies and they know this stuff, not from being in the industry, but they know it because it was actually on TV when they were, you know, a teenager or, or preteen. So it's that's it's what's so funny. special. Like the, the <laughs> Disney shows, Nickelodeon shows that I watched before, I was like really acting or pursuing it myself. It's so uh -huh. incredible to meet people from that era or who were on those shows or who worked on those shows. But we officially met at JoJo's birthday party. That was amazing. We talked for a long time. Now here we are. Yeah, here we yeah. are. That that birthday party felt like a, a J Team reunion in a way. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It just felt like I, I finally got to meet because that whole movie was made during the pandemic. Mm. I never got to meet anybody who worked on it aside from JoJo because, of course, we wrote all the songs and produced all the music, and we did those weird pandemic recording sessions through the glass where like she would have to come in one door and be quarantined in the booth and then I would come in another door and be quarantined in the control room and then we would talk through the glass and it was all you know everyone was very strict about the COVID protocols and we we're all tested so aside from seeing Jojo in the pre-production phase we handed off all the music and then I knew, knew nothing until I saw the movie again and of course I saw you and you were wonderful in the film thank you uh, but then to actually be at Jojo's birthday and there you were in the flesh it's like oh there's there she is from the there movie she is. What yeah. snarky remark is she going to make? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was so funny, actually, about that at the premiere, you know, um, the drive-in premiere, like, we all watched the movie. And then there was this, like, little girl who saw me and was, like, afraid to come up to me because, like, my character is mean in the movie. <laughs> I was like, oh, no. Well, typecasting <laughs> at its finest. They knew how to find the meanest person. They knew. <laughs> they knew. They took one look and they're like, we found, we found our villain. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, all right, let's just get into it. Where are you from? I am from Canada. I'm, that's why I'm so nice. I'm Canadian. Oh. Uh, born and raised in Toronto. Okay. And uh, moved to LA. You know, I'd been taking writing trips out here for many years. As soon as I realized this is what I wanted to do, I would kind of come out here um, and kind of meet people and network. And we, uh, I moved out here with my wife uh, when we, in 2013. But born and raised in Toronto, Canada. Wow, what was your childhood like? I mean, I had I had the best childhood. Everyone thinks it's like like a dis like like idyllic my childhood, which is kind of true. We, we talk about it all the time like we had a wonderful family. My my uh, both my parents loved music. My dad was actually a music teacher in the public school system. So there was always music in my house, like all kinds of eclectic stuff. 
singer songwriter music from the 70s you know playing yeah. musical theater classical music jazz like all kinds of wonderful stuff in the house my cousins we were also close and we're always like putting on shows for the parents you know that kind yeah. of thing <laughs> probably driving them crazy <laughs> But had a great had a great childhood in Canada. Everyone very you know family very supportive mm -hmm. of me pursuing a career in the arts, which uh, can go either way. Some yeah. parents don't get it, uh, but my parents were totally supportive. Wanted me to go to university to have uh, you know to have a plan B, uh -huh. but there was no plan B in the arts. You either yeah. need you it's it's either the one and only plan, yeah. <laughs> or. Uh, <laughs> Or you should be doing something else. But I did. I did go to university to get a a, a music degree. But that was a that was a long winded rambly answer to no, your to your initial. No, that's question. amazing. <laughs> so, how did you fall in love with music? Even growing up in a musical family, when did it go from this is my passion to this is my career? Relatively early on, actually, because you know, with my dad being a music teacher, of course, I started piano lessons when I was like four or five, and kind of liked it. But then I remember being like ten and rejecting it wholesale, being like, yeah. this sucks, you suck, I don't wanna do this, this is, yeah. why do I wanna sit there and play, learn scales? And I think I actually gave up music for a handful of years, um, obviously liking it and listening to it, um, but not actively pursuing it. And then I remember when I was 13, I met a wonderful, wonderful music teacher from, in my neighborhood in Toronto who had a very pop approach to music and it wasn't about scales and it wasn't about theory it was about playing what you love and learning how to use an instrument to your advantage and playing by ear and learning how to hear a song on the radio and play it and he would pair me up with other students of his who played different instruments and kind of create little mini bands and stuff so i was like a keyboard player so he would pair me up with a guitar player and a drummer and a bass player and boom you're like 13 years old kind of in a little rock yeah. band and like learning how to play your favorite pop songs do you have and a name for the band do we have a name we had, i was in a couple different groups the one that stands out was a group called exit 43. cool i don't know where the name came from um but maybe it you were driving and you just saw the exit and you're like that's the name <laughs> maybe i have I actually have no memory of how that <laughs> how that name came about but it was just fun because it was a bunch of guys that i knew and liked and you know we'd pick cover songs that we loved and figured out how to play them and we would do oh. battle the bands competitions and i think that was kind of instrumental in teaching me how to produce music because i learned how every instrument kind of functions in collaboration with the others and how to arrange for for different instruments, mm -hmm. despite not knowing how to play all of them. You know, I'm I'm primarily a keyboard guy. But to answer your question about when it shifted from fun to business, I was probably in my mid teens because I realized that I wasn't going to be a rock star. I wasn't going to be an actor. <laughs> you know, I'm much more comfortable behind the scenes, supporting someone else who's the star. Mm -hmm. So. In, in these bands, we were doing cover songs, as I mentioned, but then we also started writing our own songs. And then I realized that in the real world, that's often how it is too. A lot of artists don't write their own music and they need professional songwriters and producers to help them. Mm -hmm. And once I realized that that was a job, I was laser focused. Uh, that's, I just knew that was gonna be my lane. And from, I'd say 16 on, I was just consumed, like, like listening to music with an ear for, how to make it like studying it analyzing it knowing what i liked about it what i didn't like it what made it great how all the elements combined and i was one of those you know nerds in the basement with getting a, with a computer and a microphone and oh. a little keyboard and making beats and just learning the craft so i always joke that i i probably put in my ten thousand hours yeah. Before i was 18 even just because i was lucky enough to discover that i liked this path and started young enough that I, I could be focused. Wow. So you've done a lot of work with Disney Nickelodeon. Was that always the goal or the plan? I don't know that would, that it was ever the plan. It's something that's always just felt totally natural to me. Like I grew up a total Disney buff, like watching all those animated movies. Like I grew up with, you know, in the era of Little Mermaid, Aladdin, Beauty and the Beast. So that that theatricality is like in my bones mm -hmm. as much as pop music is. Cause I, I remember the first cassette tape 
that I ever owned, okay, yeah, I was born in the late 80s, relax, was Ace of Base, this, you know, Swedish pop group, like the cool. greatest pop group of all time, like perfect, perfect pop song structure. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of like, that was my world, like listening to theater and listening to pop music. And I've always kind of felt like this little, this world that I operate in is kind of like the overlap of those yes. two disciplines. Mm -hmm. To answer your question, I, I don't think I set out to it, to work in this space, but it's not a surprise that no. this is where I've ended up. It feels so natural and I'm never really fighting. It's like the one thing that I can sit down at the keyboard and these these songs just happen without well, you're much. So struggling. good at it. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> I, it was crazy because so many of the songs like I listen to every day, I realize were written by you. Oh like, come on. <laughs> I swear, I swear, I'm not joking. I'm not joking. That's um, so, funny. so you went to university. Yes. In Canada. Yes. What happened after that? I went I went to York University for I have a Bachelor of Fine Arts, mm -hmm. which um I liked I liked York University. It was very close to my house. So I, I liked it because I didn't have to like move to another city or country. You know, a lot of people when they pursue music, they go to Berkeley or there's a lot of other wonderful schools in Canada where people go for, for music. But I liked that the music program at York, it was kind of interdisciplinary. Like I could take some music courses. I could also take some theater. I could also take some uh, some film courses. Um, and they kind of wanted you to, you know, it's a Bachelor of Fine Arts. So you're in theory uh, somewhat well-versed in all elements aside from just music. Yeah. I liked it because I, I could do my classes and then kind of come home and work on what I was working on also. I never thought I had to wait to get a degree before I could yeah. pursue a career. I don't think that's really how it works in the arts at all. I think, yeah. you know, if you want that, that educational foundation, that's totally great. But I was simultaneously pursuing things on my own terms and meeting other writers and meeting artists who needed songs and wow. kind of networking in my own way. I remember going to Canadian Music Week. I, I think it is still a big annual kind of conference in oh. Toronto where everyone flies in from all over the country. So I was going to these events and I was meeting other songwriters and reading books on songwriting and going to songwriting seminars. And Wow. So you were kind of, very much a go-getter, did not wait for anyone to give you the totally. opportunity to run for it. Totally, totally. And I feel like part of that is like, I don't know if this is common for everybody in the arts, but a lot of people I've talked to feel there's like almost like the best kind of chip on their shoulder in a way where they just have to prove because everyone mocks you. Everyone's like, oh, yeah, sure. You're going to be have a successful career in the arts. Good luck with that kid. Yeah. So there's always this element of trying to prove everybody wrong. Is that what you think it came from? I don't know. I've talked about this a lot with some other like-minded people and, you know, I don't know who I was trying to prove wrong because my parents right. were very supportive. So I don't know where, why I have that drive. Maybe it was, you wanted to prove yourself right. Hmm. Maybe. This is, this is one, this is like therapy. <laughs> Think how much money you're saving me. I don't have to go see a therapist. This is fantastic. Maybe. Why do I need to prove myself right? I don't know. But, but you might be right. Hmm. You might be right. That's a fascinating thought. Well, I think it's so inspiring that you were so focused and driven at such a young age. And you had that family support, which is just a blessing. Very lucky. And I'll also credit my parents with allowing me to like live at home yeah. through those university years. Because those were four extra years that I was kind of living for free and didn't have to pay rent somewhere, yeah. didn't have to get a part-time job to help pay the bills. And I used that time to develop my craft and just keep yeah. working and networking. And it was through those years really that I put in all those, all those hours of prep. Mm -hmm. And then when I graduated, I was like 22 and the timing was like so perfect. That was like right around the era where I met you know, the music executives at Disney and Nickelodeon and kind of seamlessly transitioned into kind of working professionally. Wow. So it all, all, all kind of worked out in a kind of amazing way. Along your journey, even though there was, was never a plan B, what were the biggest mental obstacles you faced? Biggest mental obstacles? I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question. Hmm. Did Can you, you have any? 
I mean, like, aside, no, I was good. <laughs> no, life was perfect. <laughs> I could sense where things were going to be hard. Uh huh. And I didn't go there. You know, like like the paths. Like I was always lo looking for the open doors, and I want things to be seamless and easy. You know, even giving up being wanting to be a rock star. It's like the minute I saw what that actually entails to be in the public eye. It's like, this is not for me. I'm, I need uh -huh. to shift focus. So I never really pursued anything that I knew was going to cause me that much strife. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? No, this is actually really interesting. Was that deep down what you wanted or this, what you're doing now is exactly what you feel is your purpose? I mean, this I feel is exactly my purpose. I can't uh -huh. believe that I found this kind of by accident because it does feel like the perfect thing for me to be doing. It sounds like you've been able to listen to your gut in such an extraordinary way that like most people never find. Maybe so. Maybe so. I don't think that was ever a conscious thing. I don't think yeah. I'm particularly in touch with my, uh, you know, with with my gut like that. Uh -huh. I think I'm a very cerebral kind of guy and logical. So I think, you know, as I'm going through life and I see where I, where I fit best, right kind of settled where where the doors were open yes but at the same time you knocked on those doors yes i think that's a really beautiful balance of like showing up and knocking on the doors and putting yourself in the positions that you need to be in but also allowing when you know the doors aren't opening or which doors are sure Sure. You know, it reminds me of, you know, when I was getting started, of course, every songwriter dreams they're going to have a huge hit with like the biggest artist on the radio. Uh -huh. And uh, I do remember, you know, being 22, 23, writing songs and pitching them to Kelly Clarkson and thinking, oh, she doesn't know who the hell I am, but maybe <laughs> Kelly Clarkson will record one of my songs or, oh, yeah, maybe I can write for Rihanna or maybe I can write for, you know, fill in the blank of who the biggest stars were in uh -huh. 2000 five or six when I was in this era and then quickly realizing oh that's not actually quite how it works like I don't think these people are sitting on at their emails waiting for a random mp3 to come in from some guy in Canada they have <laughs> never met before and that that's a whole other discipline like you have to know these people and you have to be in their network and you have to you know there's very specific ways that those songs get made and I wasn't going to walk into that framework from you know ladder rung zero pivoting and realizing that there were other avenues that are open mm -hmm. to young writers that was kind of how i transitioned into into working where i am now when you were in your young 20s what were the big career goals i mean everyone wants to have a hit song every uh -huh. songwriter wants to have a hit song you know you want to win some awards yeah what are the goals i mean from a materialistic perspective those are the goals it's like that because to me those are signifiers of oh yeah you're doing good you yeah. know your songs are okay if you have a, if you have a big hit if you're selling millions of records if you know you can win a grammy those were and probably are the goals. I, th I don't think the, those ever really dissipate. Maybe someone more well evolved would say those things don't really matter. You want to feel <laughs> fulfilled in your heart. <laughs> like, no, I want the awards. <laughs> but I, I definitely, because I, I, I don't want the awards for the sake of having an award on my shelf. I, okay. I think it's a, it's a, it's just a signifier that you're, you're doing a good job. Who doesn't want that acknowledgement? Totally. What's it like when you see so many people on social media either doing covers of your songs, dancing to your songs? That's the coolest part. When you see things transitioning out of the original context, you know, obviously you make a song for a movie, you expect you're going to see it in the movie and that's great yeah. and it feels great to see it up on screen. Mm -hmm. But when it has life outside of that movie, that is a similar feeling of knowing, oh yeah, people really like this. This really yeah. touched them. They heard something in these songs that means something to them and they want to dance to it at their recital or they want to learn it and sing it in their, you know, talent show at school. Yeah. Um, and there's a couple songs where people still send me links that are, you know, oh, someone did this song. And, and to see the relevance of some of these songs, even years later, that you never ever would have expected it's really touching there's one song i did for a movie 
one of my first Disney projects ever was a movie called Lemonade Mouth. Oh yeah. And, <laughs> <laughs> see? A little movie called Lemonade Mouth were, back in the day. Okay. Again, you were probably prime demographic. You were probably like nine when that came out. Yeah. But I did a song for it called She's So Gone. It's the girls like standing on the table at a pizza shop singing about how she's, uh -huh. you know, she's not going back to this boy because she's, so you know, gone. She's, she's a new person now, right? Yeah. Singing about herself. And that song, people still bring up to me now a decade or more later. They're like, wow. oh my God, it's still, it's still slaps. It's still such a bop. Like it's such a, that has so much relevance. I still, this is on my gym playlist. <laughs> I listen to this when I need the confidence to like stand up to someone who's hurting me. You could never expect it. To me in that moment, I'm writing a song for that character. Right in that story who's standing up on a table at the pizza parlor telling her boyfriend she's not coming back to him uh -huh. so you could never expect a decade later all the ways that it uh it can still have relevance so that's always such a surprise and the best feeling yeah it really is it really is a treat that's incredible i i wrote a song about the uvaldi shooting and i just put it out because i just felt the need to and a dance studio in texas reached out and asked if they could choreograph a dance to it Oh, wow. And I was like, so beyond moved that it reached people who, you know, were so impacted. They wanted to make art to the art. Right. So I can only imagine the amount of videos that you see of people resonating with your lyrics. That's just like, that's the greatest gift. That's extraordinary. It is. It is a nice treat. It is a nice treat. Send <laughs> like, me a link. Send me a link. It's a greatest spend, gift. I feel like it's a nice treat. I'll spend all day uh, just scrolling, reading all the, all the, yes. <laughs> it, and it's fun now, you know, with TikTok, because I, I don't spend, I try not to spend much time on there, but I'm, I'm on there, you know, to s see what's going on. Yeah. And uh, every once in a while you hear a song you worked on and you're like, oh, this is so unusual that they've, someone's heard this and has like what you said made art to your art like they've taken it and adapted it and made their own story to it so cool so let's get into your disney days the project you've worked on absolutely <laughs> so incredible so how did that start you know i mentioned in that kind of era after university, I started taking some writing trips to LA and I was trying to meet other writers and other people in the industry that I could collaborate with and who I could pitch my songs to, kind of just looking for any open door to see where where I could, you know, make some inroads in this business as a total outsider. And realized that this Disney market existed. All the songs sounded like exactly what I was making and could make and wanted to make. Like looking at the Hannah Montana stuff and the High School Musical stuff and the Jonas Brothers, like those were the kind of things that I, I don't know, it just came naturally to me. I mean, we talked about it. it's like pop songs with a hint of like theatricality. It's just what comes naturally to me. So all along I was hearing about these wonderful executives at these companies and how I should really try to meet them. I luckily met a guy named Stephen Vincent, who's the head of music for Disney Channel. And for some reason, he was willing to listen to songs written by a complete unknown. Um, and he liked one of the songs that I'd sent him completely cold. And he's like, this is, this is right up our alley. Let me hang on to this and see if I can do something with it. Oh my God. So you that. had no prior, you know, professional experience before this? Not really. I mean, in Canada, I was trying, you know, I had a lot of independent, I was working with some independent artists, like, you know, up and coming artists in Canada would hire me to like produce a song for them. And I would do that. And I was writing a lot with people and getting to know writers who were willing to write with me, you know, more successful writers uh, than I was and am <laughs> that, that were also willing to take a chance on writing with a young kid um, and using those experiences to get better and better and better. Um, so I was doing a lot of that, but really meeting Steve and Vincent at Disney Channel was was a massive turning point because that was the way in to Disney Channel. Mm. And again, kind of the proof that, oh, this is a market that makes sense for me to be working in because sure enough, a couple months later, he reached out and said, hey, that song you sent me, I think it's actually going to work for this movie we're working on, which actually now that I'm realizing is She's So Gone that I just mentioned from Lemonade. Oh my God. And that was just like a rough cut by yourself. Yeah. I mean, it was a song I wrote with two other songwriters and we had demoed it. I think we actually, 
yeah, we had written it kind of with a Kelly Clarkson kind of artist in mind originally. So it kind of had that kind of pop rock, you know, sound that was so popular in the late 2000s. Yeah. Uh, and then he was like, you know, this could really work for this one character. We could change a couple of the lyrics and I think it's going to be right on point. And wow. I remember I was actually on vacation and I, when this call came in and I remember like writing, rewriting the lyrics on the airplane and getting <laughs> to my destination and calling my, my demo singer saying, Hey, these are the new lyrics. Can you, yeah. can you re-sing it? And sure enough, we got, have, got the song in the movie and got to know Steve and there were more projects and, you know, really found a sweet spot straddling that line between pop music and, and theater, because that's what so many of these movies are. They're, yeah. it's like musical theater just up on a screen. Yes. Do you prefer writing alone or with partners? I vacillate between the two. I think I'll always prefer writing with people because oh. it makes it so much more fun. You know, the collaboration is what makes things exciting and keeps, things feeling fresh and new you know if I'm alone I know what I'm gonna do <laughs> you know like I, I know what it's gonna sound like before I even start like my hands are gonna fall in the same place on the keyboard right. my voice is gonna sing the same melodies the way I think about lyrics and words and constructing a song I'm gonna kind of fall into the same patterns and I try to shake it up you know what and is your process do you start with the melody or do you start with the lyrics kind of neither i i kind of agonize over like the tone like the energy like i'll read a script and you know a song moment will present itself and literally will agonize for probably too long about what this moment wants to be what does this feel like what's the yeah. tempo of this what's the sound of this what's what is going to feel like the most satisfying piece of music that could come in at this moment and then i kind of do research in a way like i'll listen to a lot of stuff i'll kind of put myself in the mind of the character and like maybe we'll like jot down words or ideas or themes that that could be relevant just so like my mind is like preloaded mm -hmm. with content <laughs> with like ideas of something uh -huh. only then will i be like okay now we can try writing something and then it kind of usually comes together. You know, I'll see a lyric on a page or I'll have a, have a chord idea or a tempo idea. And then it kind of just comes together like a, a title with a melody. Wow. And then build outwards from there. Like I like preloading with ideas because anyone can make up a melody mm -hmm. and, you know, you can write words. And you can play chords on the piano. I keep doing this because there's a piano keyboard right here. I'm not just like air, air playing, tinkling. But I want it to be right. You yeah. know, if you're going to write a song and spend all that time like putting lyrics and melodies and chords together and then producing it out, you just want to make sure that it's the right song, communicating the right lyric and the right sentiment. So I always just want to, I spend way too much time probably thinking about the themes and the characters and the story and the vibe and the emotion and the, you know, the context, everything around the song. Uh -huh. so that by the time you sit down at the keyboard, it's just there and it can just come wow. out. Does that make any sense? Oh my sense? gosh. Yeah. Do you ever have writer's block? I mean, I'm very tough on myself. So I'll often, you know, write and rewrite and rewrite and this isn't good enough and I need to sit on this longer. But in my world, you know, a lot of my songs are coming from briefs like other people are telling me what to write so when there's a disney movie they're calling and saying hey this is the song we need for this story it happens in this moment this is the character that sings it this is everything that's going on you read the script and they're kind of giving you that framework so it's very easy to just kind of sit down and go from there mm. the times that have been harder to start are when you're when you're writing with no direction yeah you know like sometimes when you write with artists um you know a lot of artists come in kind of with a brief for themselves like they'll come in even if it's as simple as them being like oh you're never gonna believe what happened to me this morning i right. my my girlfriend did this or my sister said this or and, and then, you're like that's a song <laughs> yeah and then you're off to the races with the song but but then a lot of times you get together with artists or with other songwriters and there's kind of no 
destination and there's no target and it's like oh let's just write something that feels good what do you want to write today it's like well i don't know what do you mean yeah. it's so open-ended we could write anything we want like the sky's the limit how do you even you I, I i'm just a person that needs a little bit of direction a direction which i think is why i like working with artists who have a point of view and on film and television projects because those you know those frameworks are already established and I can just take them in and evolve from there. Let's talk about your work with Jojo. When did you meet her and how did that start? I mean, that's a perfect transition because right. <laughs> she's most certainly an artist with a point of view. Yes. There was never a dull moment with that girl and never a moment where we were sitting around twiddling our thumbs and like, oh gee, what should we do? What should we yes. do? She always came in knowing exactly, this is what we need to do. This is how it should sound. This is how I want to sound when I sing. This is what the lyrics need to be about. I met Jojo. I guess right after Boomerang, she had signed her big deal with Nickelodeon and I had been working with Nickelodeon for already a couple of years at this point. And Nickelodeon reached out and said, Hey, we have a, we just signed this young artist. She needs some songs. She wants, you know, we're building a, you know, this, An this empire. <laughs> we're about to, you know, yeah, this thing's going to grow. We need some music. Um, do you want to meet her? And my writing partner, Jeannie Lurie, uh, who's fantastic, who also co-wrote um, and produced all the all the songs on J-Team with, uh, Amazing. with um, we went and met this little kid who, me and Jojo will still joke that in that first meeting, she was so, such a ball of, she was like 13 maybe, uh -huh. such a goof ball, like uh, so much energy. And she, we always joke. I don't think she'll mind me saying because she would probably say it now too. But she was like, she came in being like, "I can, I can make fart sounds with nine parts of my body." And she was like, making, you know, like doing yeah. like every, like weird because she thought that would crack us up, which it did, and we're still laughing about it, That's you know, all these years later. But we really hit it off. We really hit it off. I think the feeling was mutual. I, I, I loved her energy. I loved what she wanted to communicate with her music yeah. and i think she really liked working with me and Jeannie, and that was kind of the beginning of years years of working together on almost all her stuff we we wrote the first song we ever wrote together was called kid in a candy store i know that i know all of them <laughs> <laughs> and you know they did a big music video and i want to hear a fun fact i auditioned yes. for that music video to dance in oh it. really yep I remember I can do the choreography for you. Oh, wow. That yep. is so fun. What a, what a piece of trivia. <laughs> and then you finally got J team and then you're like, I knew I was meant to be in your orbit. I had, Oh, that's another story for another day. But, um, I auditioned for a number of, um, her projects. Obviously the J team is like more than I could have ever dreamed of, you know, many months passed and it came time to do more music. And she wrote, we wrote a bunch more songs and really just connected. And I think the process worked so well, uh, for all of us that we really started, we, we really locked in and kind of did almost all of her stuff from that point on and, wow. um, till now. And, and we, we got to work on some wonderful, wonderful things with her. Obviously working on J team was a massive highlight because for Jeannie and I, who both work so much in the film space mm -hmm. to be able to do pop songs for one of our favorite artist collaborators yeah. that was also in a movie like talk about the yeah. layers of the venn diagram this was like the sweet spot in the middle that was so perfect for us and obviously you know talk about the treats of seeing your you know the fruits of your labor out in the ether when jojo did you know three years on the road of uh you know with her concert tour I mean, it was only three years because the pandemic kind of stopped it a handful of times, but she did over a hundred sold out concerts from here to Australia, to London, sold out the O2, like all these incredible, yeah. incredible venues. You know, I was the music director for her tour and we worked on all the music together. And what was it like sitting in that stadium and hearing those kids like, I mean, it's the greatest, way. I mean, you're gonna make fun of me if I say, oh, it's a real treat. It's a real treat. But it, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's really one of the most rewarding, rewarding things that can happen for a songwriter, especially for someone like me, because I don't do a lot of music that you hear on the radio. You know, a lot of songwriters in the, in the States, you know, they'll be in a restaurant and their songs will come on the radio. And that's like the greatest achievement ever. That's always the pinnacle where you're like, oh, I know I've made it when I hear my songs on the radio. But like, they aren't really playing film, you know, Disney Channel songs on the radio. 
-hmm. and a lot of the music I do, you know, I do a lot of K-pop, which we can talk about, a lot of a lot of J-pop, and those songs are on the radio, but not here. Well, now they are here, right. but you know, at the time, yeah, you know, they're on the radio in Korea and in Japan. So I wasn't really. See it, it seemed like my work was invisible because I'm like, okay, it's either like no one knows my work unless they're aware of j-pop and k-pop music or unless they have kids but with jojo it was finally like oh people know some of the stuff i'm working on and i can go to a concert in los angeles and hear 90 minutes of my songs wow um, so it was a treat <laughs> <laughs> um this is so sad i had tickets to see her on tour and it was gonna be my first concert i've never been to like a stadium concert I was so excited and then I got COVID. <laughs> when was this? In January of um, this year. So wait, you still haven't been to, have you been to a concert by now? No, I've been to the Hollywood Bowl and seen like a concert there, but I've never been to like a stadium concert. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, so wow. she was going to be my first concert. And oh, that would have been um, so great because you know her, like that would have been so special to, to see her and support her. <laughs> Yeah. Are you, oh my God. I was so excited. And there was like a clip from the J team on the screen and, oh, I was so excited, but, um, yeah, I got COVID and I was like, no, that really sucks. Yeah. That really sucks. Yeah. I saw that show many, many times. Like the summer of 2019 was so fun because like almost any day, wherever you were in this country, there was Jojo Siwa. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like we flew to Phoenix for the dress, you know, for their tech rehearsals. And I had to, you know, I was there for just to make sure the show got up and running. And my wife came and we saw the dress rehearsal. We saw the very first show. And then like a couple of days later was her birthday, which I'm trying to do the math. I think it was her 16th birthday. When was she, I guess she turned 16 and 2019 anyway it was she was yeah. like the week of her birthday and she played at the microsoft theater saw her again and then you know yeah. she played in anaheim and we went again and she yeah. played in santa barbara and we're like oh let's spend the night nice can you imagine so if someone like didn't know what you do for a living and you have like all of her songs in your spotify and like you're not really <laughs> 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 yeah, that is funny. I mean, you got to make sure when you go to make sure the lanyard is very visible. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that's amazing. Um, so what were some of the other Disney Nickelodeon projects you worked on? Because I know you did Girl Beats World, right? You did the yeah, that was that? such a, that was such a fun one. I mean, that to do with the, that theme song was so, so fun. Yeah, Girl Meets World, you get the song brief and they're like, hey, we're rebooting Boy Meets World. This is what yeah. it's supposed to, how you want it to be what we wanted to communicate and you know again we agonized with my co-writers and my co-producers and we're like what should this sound like what could this be what's the like ultimate yeah. phrase that could capture this new reboot mm -hmm. and we landed on take on the world and the rest is history do you realize how iconic you are oh come on <laughs> no, like that was like my childhood too and you got to work with i mean like sabrina carpenter was it was kind of the earlier stages of her career and now she's this huge artist and um zendaya did you get to work with her yeah i got to meet and work with zendaya super early on like in the shake it up era we actually met in toronto because she was there shooting something I, and i ran into her and her dad at a at a premiere maybe even for a movie i worked on because that's probably why i was there and i and i recognized her because you know i'm aware of who these and I'm, I'm like oh you're zendaya and i met her dad and uh -huh. we exchanged so info and kept in touch i mean it was yeah yeah and uh i think we wrote a song or two together and recorded them together while she was up there and kept in touch and hung out with the family and in, in LA and you know I would run into them at all kinds of events over the years and now of course she's such a huge star so that's super cool to uh to say oh we knew her when we yeah knew her when. <laughs> who were some of your other favorite artists you worked with oh I mean the the kids like the the Disney Channel artists are all so so wonderful like I have such fond memories of working with with everyone because they're all so professional like they all come in such total pros like so prepared they care about their job just like I do so it's nice you never feel like they're goofing around or they're not taking it seriously but I have great memories of working with Ross Lynch and Laura Morano on Austin and Alley I did so many songs for Austin and Alley over the 
five years of that show. Yeah. Got to know Dove Cameron really well. Spent hundreds of hours with Dove over the years. You worked year. with her recently or in the past, in the pandemic, right? Uh, yeah, we did something together. We, she, they came in to do, we did an animated kind of spinoff of Descendants for, they called it Descendants of the Royal Wedding. It was mm -hmm. an animated kind of the culmination of that chapter of all the Descendants stuff. And they brought back most of the original cast, obviously Cameron wasn't there. You which get to was, work with him. I worked with Cameron on, uh, not on anything for Descendants, but we did some like holiday songs that he performed at, uh, at like Disneyland or something. Uh -huh. <laughs> so we did work. I do remember flying up to Vancouver while they were shooting one of the Descendants movies and all the kids coming into the studio and getting to work with all of them, Dove, Sophia, Boo Boo, Cameron. So good memories of so all of them. I have so many friends um, from J Team who were in Descendants. I'm sure, right? Because they were yeah. up there. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, cool. Yeah, such a treat to work on Descendants and work with work with those guys. I have great memories working with Olivia Holt. And actually some funny, a funny, you know, just how things all work. When I <laughs> met Olivia, we were writing songs for her as an artist because she had just been signed to Hollywood Records. And we thought, oh, maybe we'd have a chance at getting some songs on, on her album. So we wrote with her because we she was a family friend of one of my co-writers and we all got to know each other very well. Songs did not make it onto her album, but we pitched them to um, other artists and almost every song we wrote for Olivia has now been cut. Really? And some of them are like very big pop songs in, wow. uh, in Korea. That's so cool. You never know. You never know. I mean, that's the cool thing about music is that when you write a song, it's like never dead. Like if it never, if it doesn't work for what you originally thought, you can always kind of retool it and uh, maybe it could speak to a different artist. Yeah. And Maya Mitchell, you worked with on Teen oh, Beach? Oh, yeah, on Teen Beach. <laughs> oh, I have such a good memory. Like Teen Beach, that was so such a funny timing because I just, they were making that movie in 2014 and I just got married. Oh, wow. And I got a call from Stephen Vincent, the head of music at Disney Channel, saying, Hey, so I have good news and bad news. The bad news is that they're already off shooting shooting the movie. So usually we would do pre-production to record all the vocals in LA before the cast moves on to location. But he's like, they already they already moved to shoot it. So uh -huh. we can't get them in LA. We're gonna have to travel you. Oh. And he's like, but the good news is they're shooting in Puerto Rico. <laughs> oh. <Wow. laughs> so, but here was the, the joke was that I was, I wasn't even in LA. I was in Toronto, literally getting married like that week. Oh and so I'm like, okay, like I'll go to Puerto Rico, but the only way it's going to work is if I fly directly from Toronto to Puerto Rico. And also like, I'm with my wife, like yeah. we just got married. Like, what am I going to, I can't send her. So I ended up. <laughs> you're saying your vows and get a call and you're like, listen, yeah, I'm I mean, busy right now. <laughs> yeah, it was basically all that week, but we managed to work it out, you know, bought her a ticket. We literally packed up from our wedding. You know, we finished all the festivities in Canada and got on a plane and went to Puerto Rico. And that was kind of our honeymoon really, because we didn't really get to do anything else after that. I spent like two days recording vocals. I saw the whole cast, like seven actors back to back. Wow. Um, you know, Ross Lynch, Maya Mitchell, Jordan Fisher, who has become a really good friend. And that was probably one of the first things I'd ever worked on with him. Eric Clayton, uh, so many wonderful actors came in. And then after we got the vocal, we moved to a different hotel on the different part of the island and we just like relaxed. We got an incredible hotel room, just the wow. two of us. And yeah. That. But there's some great photos of me somewhere where I set up a laptop uh -huh. overlooking the ocean and I had to edit all these vocals because they uh -huh. needed them for playback to, for, so the actors could lip sync on set. I had to take some time in Puerto Rico on my eh, honeymoon. Honeymoon, yeah. Uh, what does a session look like when you're recording with an artist for a movie or TV show? Like in terms of the structure of, the, of a session? Yeah, like what, how does it work? We show up at a studio. Hopefully the actors are prepared and they understand what is happening. Like they know the song, they know the story. Sometimes they need a refresher and they're like, oh, this is the opening song, right? This is for the, yeah, right. Cause you know, everyone's shooting out of order. They've just come from right. a dance rehearsal doing a different song. They always, you yeah. know, sometimes they forget. You know, we get them all set up in the recording booth. They get their headphones on. We pick the mic we're gonna use. I like to go kind of slowly through the song and take things in little pieces and we break things up into chunks that are easy to workshop and we go a couple lines at a time 
and uh, really work on how the melody goes, how the best way to deliver it is, where they should be breathing, where they should fall off, where they should end, where, where they should scoop, where they should do, use vibrato, yeah. you know, all the little things, kind of perfect it, move on to the next chunk, next chunk, next chunk, and then at the end we always do a couple fun passes from top to bottom, and then hopefully they've nailed it. Hopefully. Hopefully yeah. they've nailed it. Wow, that's incredible. So for High School Musical, the musical, the series. I've, I've done a handful of songs for the for the new series. The, on season one, one thing I worked on that I'm always very proud of is I produced a song that Olivia Rodrigo wrote herself called All I Want. Wow. I'll never forget, I got a call saying, hey, Olivia wrote a song. Did you know her before this? Yeah, we had done a lot of songs together for Bizarre Vark. Uh-huh. Uh, so we did know each other, granted, you know, those were like comedy songs yeah. for like a, a comedy series. So, you know, fast forward a year or two, I maybe hadn't seen her. All of a sudden she's the star of this new show and she wrote this song and they sent me a, you know, the voice note that she had written the song at the piano and your jaw drops to the floor. You're like, this is an incredible song. And she wrote it like completely. <laughs> she just wrote by it herself. completely by herself. She was 16. Yeah. Max. That's crazy. Yeah. And, you know, produced the song for her. That was in the first season of the show. And it did kind of take off outside of the show. It charted on the Billboard Hot 100. And, wow. you know, it did very well streaming. And that's one of the things that I've seen on, you know, TikTok. People have made all kinds of covers and, you know, videos to that song. And did you go to her tour? You know, I have not seen her oh. on tour, actually. Wasn't she singing that song in some of her shows? Yes, yes. That people, would be incredible have, to people witness. People sent me videos of that, which was really cool. I wish I did get a chance to see her, but no, I, I haven't been personally, but people did send me a lot of videos and she was singing that, which makes me happy to hear that that song is still part of her, you know, identity as an artist because she's so incredible and her album is so fantastic. And we did another song for season two and I then wrote a couple songs for season two and season three. And working now on some stuff for season four, which is wow. which is uh, that we're in production as we speak. Mm -hmm. So I love those people. Tim Federley, the creator of the show, is just the best. They've really assembled like it seems like the nicest family. You know, every set is different. It's not always this beautiful, but it really sounds like they have a wonderful team working on that show, and everyone's everyone's pretty happy over there. So it's nice yeah. to be able to play my little part it really does as an outsider feel that it's a really like happy family yeah and honestly before really that show I didn't really see that that kind of like teen theater right. kid TV show where they all genuinely looked like a theater family right and so seeing that cast was kind of like actually a see to believe for me of like oh it is possible. Yeah, I think they've they've tapped into a really cool and specific demographic on that show because there are so many theater people and music people out there. Um, and I think this really speaks to them. And Yeah, and the songs are so good. The songs are fun. And they've done That's such amazing. a great job of like integrating new songs with the old songs and like revitalizing songs from the original high school musical and other projects. You know, they've used songs from Frozen and they've used songs from Camp Rock. And um, it somehow is just magic when it all comes together. And it's so funny. Like, it's just so such a funny right. show. Like, I actually enjoy watching it because I don't know, just the layers of meta-ness. Yeah. <laughs> Is it fun watching your colleagues and people that you work with, you know, on their show? Because you know the whole cast and you've worked with them. Yeah, I mean, I try to watch everything that I've worked on, at least because it's fun to, you yeah. know, I like to see everyone in their element because I usually only get to see them in my little fraction of how we work together on one song here and there. But it's fun twofold to see the finished product because I want to see how it all came together, you know, how the song works, how it flows, how they get in and out, how it feels when it when it happens. Yeah. Like when the song happens, because you want to know if you did it right. <laughs> you know, yeah, like totally. if it's working. Did this yeah. work? Did this achieve what we wanted to achieve? But also you hit the nail on the head. Like it's just so great to see these people that I've come to know in their element. Right. Making it all come to life around your little piece.
Right. So the song Rising for season three, mm. which was sung by the incredible Julia Lester, oh, who the we best. know and love. You wrote that with Cozy. How do you pronounce her yeah. name? Zulsdorf. Cozy mm. Zulsdorf is another fantastic, fantastic person that I've I met through the magic of Disney. We, she was the star of the, of the Freaky Friday movie that they made a few years ago. Yeah, we Heidi were... Blickenstaff. I just saw oh. her in Naga Little Pill. Did you get to see that? No, is she still oh, on? No. I, everyone's no. texting me saying you have to go see it. They, they just closed at the Pantages. Yeah, but I got to see her and she was it. unreal. And she was on the soundtrack for Something Raw and I was listening to the other day. I was like, oh, that's so cool. But yeah, she did Freaky Friday. Oh, I really wanted to see her in Jagged Little Pill. Well, I guess I'll have to track it down in another city then. Yeah. But yeah, Heidi was in the movie. I got to, that was such a great, oh my goodness. You're making me think of all these wonderful <laughs> memories and stories like flying to New York because I produced two songs, well, three songs for the Freaky Friday movie and two of them were Heidi's songs. And I flew to New York. She's unbelievable. Yeah. You know, take one, you have it. I feel like I flew here. Maybe we should get a second take just for safety. <laughs> like, what you she's like a Broadway star. Yeah, totally. Know? I mean, she knew, you know, take one, it was ready to go. Like she had worked out every nuance. It was like, boom. Wow. Um, but I'm like, we came all the way here. Or <laughs> Should we just, turn, I guess we turn around and go home. You nailed it. Wow. Like, what more could I ask for? But yeah. I have great memories on that trip. If Cozy's watching this, she'll die of laughter because I tell the story any chance I get. That week I was there was like one of the last weeks Ben Platt was doing Dear Evan Hansen. Uh -huh. And I got a ticket and got to see him in it. And it was game changing. Really? For me as a, as a, you know, a theater person, it just reminded me how much I love theater and how cool theater can be and how it can change over time. And people think theater is one thing. And I, my impression of that show is that it was so contemporary and pop. Like it felt so much like the songs I make. Yeah, um, totally. This is theater. This is on Broadway. Like it doesn't all have to be jazz hands and kick lines. Yeah. And he was just so fantastic in it. It wow. was, it was really incredible to see, but back to cozy. I've had two cups of coffee, if you can't tell. <laughs> she was the star of the movie. We were paired together to write the opening title credit song and had the greatest time writing this song and making it together. And we really hit it off as friends and kind of kept in touch since then. And she's an incredible songwriter on her own, in her own right. And almost like Olivia Rodrigo, Cozy would send me voice notes of, hey, what do you think? This is a little something I started by myself. That was brilliant. And it's, good. And it's like three minutes of the most perfect pop song you've ever wow. heard. And you're like, she's killer. So we've, I produced a couple songs that she wrote by herself and we've now written a lot of songs together as a songwriting duo. And we've done a couple things for High School Musical the musical, the series, including Rising, which was such a treat to do. That was like a full circle moment to have Julia come in to do that um, and, and special for Cozy and me um, and a couple of fun treats for season four that we're still, we're still working on as we speak. Wow. Oh, I'm excited. Yeah. She's someone that I, I would love to meet and get to know. She is so talented and just seems like so such an incredible person oh, too. You'd love her. You'd yeah. love her. Yeah. I'll, I'll do an, an, an intro. I would love, I would really love that. I yeah. expect to see the, the behind the resume. Yes, she's invited. <laughs> she's absolutely, she's genuinely on my list, but um, yes, absolutely. I think it's so cool that you seem to like really understand the voice of Gen Z. Well, listen, let's not get carried away here. <laughs> <laughs> let's not get carried away. I spend a few minutes a day scrolling TikTok. I see a little of what's going on, but I'm smart enough to write with people who do understand the voice of Gen Z, uh, <laughs> like Cozy. <laughs> no, I see what you're saying. And I do, you know, it goes back to that agonizing part. It's like, I wanted like, and probably the, you know, the 2% actor in me wants mm. to like, just understand the character, any character that I'm yeah. writing for, you know, you put yourself in that mindset, what would they be feeling? How would they say it? And that's kind of the fun part of the, of the job. It's like when you get to put that hat on and just like riff as if you're the character. He's reliving his Joseph days. <laughs> oh, jo <laughs> just enough. Just enough. Just um, enough and then let it go. <laughs> what are the best parts of your job and what are the hardest parts of your job? Hmm. I mean, nothing will ever beat the feeling of when you think you have something special. 
Yeah. You know, when you, you know, cause we spend so much time alone in these studios, either literally alone or me with my co-writers and co-creators and, you know, you slog away all day, every day. And then every once in a while, there's something that you genuinely love and you're yeah. like, oh, wow, this is really great. Like, I really think we nailed it. Like that moment of inception or creation or whatever, when you think you've landed on something yeah. is so special and just the best feeling ever creatively because it's just so rewarding. Mm -hmm. And then I would say the next best part is when the network agrees. <laughs> like a lot of these songs you're writing on spec and they've taken spec submissions from a lot of other songwriters too. So when they call you and say, congratulations, we're using your song. Yeah. That's like, you know, it's great because, okay, you're going to, the song's going to be in the movie. It's going to, you know, that's, that's one side of it, but also it's very vindicating because it's like, yeah, I knew it. I knew we had something great here. Does that happen often where you love a song and doesn't get chosen? I mean, yeah, yeah. It, 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 there's really no rhyme or reason, which is the funniest thing that I've come to learn over the yeah. years. It's like sometimes there's stuff I love mm -hmm. that doesn't get chosen mm -hmm. and it's a bit heartbreaking, but then you remember, oh, maybe it'll have a life. It's still a great right. song. Maybe we'll find a way to reuse it for something else or change it up or find the kernel that we liked about it and change up the rest. Well, it's kind of like as an actor doing a self tape that you're so proud of and then not getting the part and you're like, yeah, darn, you know, and, then, and I love, you know, in those circumstances, I love watching the finished product to see what they did go with, because I find it very educational. And, you know, I've heard a lot of actors talk about, well, if they hire someone else, it's not because you sucked. It's just because well, yeah. they were looking for something different. And I always used to think, oh, that's just something that uh, the rejected actors always say. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, but it's so true. It's uh -huh. so true. And I've seen it on this on a song level because I could have written the best song I've ever written. But when I hear what they've gone with, it's very cathartic because I'm like, oh, it was just the wrong. Like they went with a completely right. different energy. And it speaks yeah. back to the inception that I was talking about when you're like, what's your what's your process? I'm like, well, I just want to make sure I nail the right energy. Sometimes they've just picked a different vibe altogether. Like maybe mine was too sentimental and they wanted something that was a little more fun. Yeah, but like so, you said, you just store the songs and they can be used for something else, which is so exactly. cool because it's never like a wasted, you know. Exactly. I feel like I'm my own worst critic and yeah. sometimes I'll get myself in ruts because yeah. I want to nail it so badly for my you know, if, so, if someone's called me looking for a song, they're trusting me to deliver what they need. Mm -hmm. And I always want to be the guy who can deliver and show up and, and, and give them exactly what they're looking for. But sometimes, you know, you just work yourself up into a, a tizzy. <laughs> like, am I, is this right? Is this good enough? I don't know. You know, there's limitless options. It's like, right. is this the right tempo? Should I have gone with this tempo? Should we go with this title or that title? So many factors at play. You want to make songs cool. You want to make sure they work for the movie, but you also want to make sure they can work outside of the movie. Yeah. You, know, you want them to be hits on their own. Like, oh, are people going to like this on the radio? Are people going to make TikTok dances to this song? Are they, you know, is the director going to like it? Is the network going to like it? Can the actor sing it? Yeah. Like, is it within their range? Like, there's so much stuff. Does that happen in often where you write a song and then the actor isn't able to sing it? I mean, within reason. But again, that's all part of my agony that I put into before I start the song. Like, I, right. I always want to know who's singing it, what the range is. I go, I listen to as much as I can. Right. That's actually another very rewarding part of the process is when I've studied an actor's voice. Yeah. And then I hear them actually do my song. Uh -huh. Like I remember the first time that really happened on one of my first Disney Channel songs ever was for Sharpay's Fabulous Adventure, which was a spinoff cool. of High School Musical and uh, Ashley Tisdale was a star of the movie. I love her. And she's the best. So and cool. obviously, you know, I'd watched all the High School Musical movies. And when I was pitching these songs for her character, I like studied her voice and I knew exactly what her range was. And not just her range, but like, the way she sings and yeah. like the style of her voice. And like, as we were writing our songs, I was like imagining her voice doing it. And then when you actually get the cut, 
and they're like, congratulations, we're going to use your song in the movie. You know, show up at this date and we're going to, and then at the studio and you're going to record Ashley's vocal on the song. And then fast forward and you're there and she's there and she sings it. And it's like exactly how you imagined it would be. Yeah. It's just so vindicating as well, because it's like, I knew this was going to sound great. Like we <laughs> agonized so long and, for, and so hard over making sure this was going to feel right for you and then there she is doing it and it's wow. and it's flawless but yeah sometimes you have to change keys or you have to adapt things but not not often because you know if you put in enough uh agonizing research and work yeah. and then you get someone like julia lester who can literally do everything and we almost want to make things harder knowing she's coming in We're like oh who's doing this julia oh no 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 we got to raise the key Oh my God, that's amazing. Um, what advice would you give to someone who wants to follow in your footsteps? Hmm, that's a great question. I mean, I, I put in a lot of work. Mm -hmm. I don't think anything in this business, I mean, there's always an element of luck, but I think, what do they say? What's the expression? Luck is opportunity meets preparedness yeah. or something. Yeah. You can't control the opportunity, or maybe you can. You can kind of create opportunities for yourself. Mm -hmm. But the one thing you really have control over is being prepared. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing stopping anybody from learning how to be the best that they can possibly be at whatever it is they want to do. I go back to me being a total nerd at 15, 16, 17, like not not having much of a social life, not being like a frat guy in college, not like going out partying. And I didn't have a, a massive circle of friends. All my friends were other music nerds who came over to my house and we would figure out how to make music. Yeah. And oh, what happens if I ha learning how to edit vocals, learning how to get different sounds and how to mix and how to do all these things. It's probably even easier now with technology. You have access to all these incredible tools for practically free mm -hmm. it's free to sit and write a song mm -hmm. you just got to do it over and over and over and over and over again and you learn something different every time so i mean advice learn as much as you can try to be the best you can be yeah that's great advice I don't um, know. if your 15 year old self could see you now what do you think he'd say why isn't your house bigger? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm totally kidding. I'm totally kidding. Um, I don't know. I'd like to think that my 15 year old self would be proud of me now. Would be like, oh, you've 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 managed to find a space in the business that is rewarding, creatively satisfying. You know, we're making a living. Uh, having fun doing it. I, I really feel most of the time that I'm happy mm -hmm. doing what I'm doing. So I, I hope that my 15 year old self would, would recognize that. Yeah. And, uh, and you're making art that's resonating. Well, <laughs> art, art that's resonating. Yes, sure. Yeah. Yeah, you it, are. It, I mean, it, gosh, the videos, like they're it's, endless. It's practically you know, I'm practically the new Picasso is what I'm hearing. Yeah, that's what I'm hearing. Exactly. Yes, I will totally take that. I always love to end on this question. What do you want your legacy to be? Ooh. Wow, that there's so many layers. This is yep. this. There's so many layers to that question. My legacy. I mean, I presume you mean my professional legacy. Um, Personally, both. I don't know. I'd like for people to look back and think that I was a happy guy, like, like, oh, he did his thing and enjoyed himself and like wrote some songs, you know, I don't know that I, I have like a world domination. I hope that people might think I have made an impact on this, on this demographic. There's something so special about songs being a part of your childhood. Like it's, it's so cool. Yeah, that is a cool, that is a cool bonus. That is a cool bonus. But I hope, I hope people think, oh, he's a nice guy. He had his shit together, made some songs and croaked. <laughs> <laughs> With that being said. <laughs>
How's that? That is perfect. Thank you so much for doing this. I am so glad that our paths crossed. Yes. And I'm likewise. hoping we get to work on many, many projects together. Yes, me too. I'm so glad we got to meet. Thank you for uh, inviting me on here and for making this uh, easy and painless for a guy who does not belong in front of the camera. <laughs> That's going to be the new <laughs> behind the resume cast phrase, easy and painless. Easy and painless. Yeah, we love it. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>